And welcome back. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says that plans to expropriate land without compensation would be a disaster for South Africa's economy and South Africa's people. Now, speaking in Addis Ababa yesterday, Pompeo said that the policy proposal is an example of centralized planning that's failed in other countries such as Zimbabwe, Tanzania and Ethiopia. Meanwhile, Parliament's Land Committee is holding public hearings for submissions on legislation that will amend Section 25 of the Constitution to include a clause to allow for land expropriation without compensation. Economic consultant Dr. Peter Karungu and uh, Ernest Van Sael, AfriForum's campaign officer, uh, join us uh, for this discussion. Mr. Van Sael is here, but uh, Dr. Karungu, I'm going to start with you. So, firstly, should we be concerned that the United States uh, is, at this point, making these pronouncements? I would be concerned because the Secretary of the United States, to say the failed state are Ethiopia and Tanzania, that's not true. On the contrary, we can prove the opposite. First and foremost, if you look at the development and the growth in Ethiopia of 11%, 9% on average the last 10 years, is emanating from small-scale farming, coffee farming. So sometimes the pronouncement of these numbers and the figures are shocking to economists because when you throw them without facts, that scares me, number one. Number two, let's understand the following. The greatest concern South Africa need to address is the following. How long can we sustain an employment of 20-39%? How long can we have the level of hopelessness? How long can we sustain a situation in which literally 20% sit on 80% of the wealth? We've got to start thinking what is today short, medium, and long term. For our children, we need to address the issues of unemployment, inequality, helplessness. First and foremost, apartheid was a crime against humanity of untold proportion. The most it did the worst, in my view as an economist, is to, die, to, to deny masses access to good education, analytical skills that has led us to where we are. Number two, it is forceful eviction of moving people from natural resources that are God-given and taken to live under squatter condition. Even today, the threat of South Africa is not necessarily the diseases. It's this inequality that was man-made, that was put together by a system that we try not to address because we fear we hurt those who are privileged. And that's a major concern. And Ms. Vincel, um, Mike Pompeo's uh, concerns, are they valid? Yes, I think it's a, well, Afri Forum welcomes the comments and the concerns. I think really this is an important conversation to be had. As Afri Forum said, with our World Must Know campaign now, we want the world to be watching South Africa to make sure that uh, the South African politicians know that if they were to um, violate anyone's rights or even property rights, that the world will be taking notice and that uh, it's not just a cowboy open season in South Africa to be uh, taking land or to not be responsible in terms of our economic policies. And that's why AfriForum, for example, uh, published an investor's guide also this, uh, this year, just this week, that said that uh, we want uh, international investors to know that Here's the information about what can happen in South Africa, and we want international investors to push back against destructive economic policies. Because at the end of the day, this is about the entire economy that affects every single South African. And if uh, we let politics or populist rhetoric take over and not be uh, responsible with our economic policies, then we are on a very dangerous road indeed. So share with us what you shared with those international investors. What is it that they should be on the lookout for? Well, uh, I wasn't uh, one of the authors of the report, but uh, for example, we, we are basically, to, to give it in a simple manner, we gave them information in terms of, they should be, it's not information in terms of how to, uh, we don't, AfriForum doesn't want uh, people to divest from South Africa. We just want them to be aware that South Africa has politicians that are, that are currently threatening their investments and that they, we give them the information to empower them to be able to 
uh, like Secretary Pompeo now, in a certain ma in, a, in a similar manner, um, push back against it and say, but we do not want, for example, our investments expropriated in your country. But how would they be expropriated? How are investments being threatened by the proposed amendment? Well, uh, by by destructive economic policies. If we, for example, uh, take a reckless uh, approach to land or, for example, to expropriation, that will be a, a pretty much lead to the collapse of the economy like we saw in Zimbabwe. And that would mean that these, in, these investors lose everything that they have in South Africa. So I think it's only fair that they are aware of the, the, the dangers that, are, that lurk within populist rhetoric that we're seeing in South Africa. I think I have tremendous respect for Africa Forum in terms of intellectual. But what they say and the hype they give cannot be supported by economic facts. Let me give you some facts. South Africa is endowed with the most resources worldwide, in the most industrial country in Africa. It has the highest unemployment rate in Africa. Kenya, unemployment rate is between 12 and 9 percent. In a country like Ghana, it's 6.8 percent. In a clip like Nigeria, with 200 million people, is 23 percent. In our country, it's unspeakable. A, because we don't want to address the challenges we face. You can talk about investors from anywhere, but if you don't understand the underlying problem we face, that a structural, economic structural problem, based on the fact, A, like I said, you evicted people from a natural resource relocated them to squatter condition without giving them even education. You can't address that in parliament. It has to be a free forum and ask economists and you and I to start saying, one, A, in the event we don't address these things now, the future of our children and grandchildren is that bleak. We need to stop thinking short term, like I hear from my colleague. We need to think short, medium and long term and ask, is this sustainable? Whereby in my view, the picture we see as you drive from anywhere from Joburg for 300 kilometers is fast pieces of land with the square huts around. And somewhere inside in a kilometer, you see a, a, a big home, a mansion. The land at times is not used. Nobody says we can make reckless decisions. Parliament is honored to be respected. We also see the fracas in national, in parliament, in Congress, in United States. We are seeing even the speaker tearing papers. We, we watch that. We are saying the world has reached a point whereby rationality needs to be guided by fair play, pragmatic solutions. Afri Forum knows it's not sustainable to have the privilege 20% without considering the poorest of the poor who are the majority. I'll give you a good example. If you go to meetings in Stellenbosch, where I go to discuss business with people, whatever, you get to be told, I quote, in Stellenbosch, you are told, listen, if the product we have here is not recommended by Switzerland system, we can't sell it in South Africa. That's the mentality we need to change. Not to talk about the Secretary of State, who himself does not know the fastest growing economy in Africa is Ethiopia, the fastest growing economy in Africa is Tanzania, and Pam the must fail the state. That doesn't make sense. He needs to understand that this is where the growth is. But more important, like I said, give those who are at the given, the poor farmers. The logic I hear from Afri Forum is that if we let them farm, they cannot produce, we can only do commercial farming. That is not true. Because history tells you, if you go read, when Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, after independence, it, the theory was only commercial farm can do coffee, only commercial farm can do cotton, only commercial farm can do sisal, only commercial farm can do, can do tea. But it changed. People were given 30 acres, 50 acres. We tripled production. Today, most of the fastest growing economy is where they are driven by small scale farmers. If and Afri Forum need to test this. If today we give land to the majority of the poor, we give them the input, we can turn around unemployment in this country by 10% in five years. That's common call. It's for you and I to benefit. It's not for us to defend the impossible, knowing it's not sustainable. But more important, and this is where we need to be able to change. I keep on hearing, try to imagine, 
all the farms in this country, the, mechanic, the mechanical drivers are black drivers. The people planting, the people who are weeding. Give them 50 hectares and tell him this is your land. We're going to win 100%. Finally, the most supported system worldwide is agriculture support system in the US and the France or the European Union. They spend trillion to support farmers. In the United States in 1990, when I was a student, they were spending 280 billion to support farmers to make sure the farmers and the people in the urban rural areas live at a better lifestyle. We are saying, let's do the same, but we are told by people who know better, my colleagues here, that we can do it. So what are we, as I'm proposing, in my view, in the long term, they are saying, as long as we don't do it now, let our children have nothing because it will have inevitably to change. For one principle, look, if we argue democracy is one man, one vote, and the people with very little, the people who are helpless, the people who are evicted, become the majority, they'll vote you out. It doesn't matter what you say, and they're going to take over, and it's going to be a disaster we are looking at. I want Afri Forum to start pragmatic thinking, economic thinking, that is long term, not opportunistic, not what somebody says. What somebody says has no relevance to South Africa because South Africa is facing dire, 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 dire situation of high crime, high people uneducated, a lot of people who don't have jobs and we need to address it. Mr. Patsaya? Right, well, no, uh, very interesting information there. Actually, uh, uh, agree with some of it in terms of, well, uh, I like the fact that you mentioned some case studies in Africa, uh, especially Ethiopia. A lot of, uh, if you go look at the, the economy at the moment, a lot of their growth is coming from trade liberalization through protecting property rights, give, incentivizing entrepreneurs to start businesses and liberalizing their economy and not, as uh, Secretary Pompeo said, uh, state centralized socialism basically where you just put more and more power in the state's hands and it doesn't really benefit the people at all. He's warning against situations where as seeing as we are comparing current case studies in the world he's warning against cases like Venezuela where they did land expropriation and it failed horribly where they uh, did it in Zimbabwe where you are seeing now I think in the first they're expecting now in the first quarter Zimbabwean industry to shrink by 37% this year that is a catastrophe for the poor in that country and you want to bring that to South Africa that's why South uh, Africa Forum is saying we need to we need good dialogue and we need to talk about sound economic policy and for example when you talk you cannot deny the past you cannot deny that there were wrongs committed in the past and they, that they needs to be in the in the present need to work towards a more equitable society i think that's pretty pretty uh, good stance to take but then you also need to remember that uh, i'm glad that my colleague here mentioned the, the this whole there's this big conversation at the moment about crime against humanity or that type of idea in South Africa. And what I find interesting is in that UN declaration declaring a part of the crime against humanity, they also declare expropriation of, uh, expropriation of land from a, uh, targeting a racial group for uh, land expropriation as a crime against humanity. So we can't solve the problems of the past or the, the, the wrongs of the past by committing crimes against humanity in the present. I, 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 it's a very bizarre idea for me. So if How you do look, you explain that? Because the <clears throat> fact of the matter, as you acknowledge yourself, is that there was a crime perpetrated, there has to be redress for that crime that was perpetrated. How do you suggest the, re the redress happens? Because Secretary Pompeo is oblivious to the fact that we've had a willing buyer, willing seller policy in this country uh, since our democratic, our democratic dispensation that hasn't worked. It hasn't seen the, de 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 desired results. Hence, we are now at a point where people are looking for alternatives. Say, how else can we address this land question such that it actually gives you the desired hmm. results. No, exactly. I think that's a very good question because I think that is the big question or the big debate or the crux of the debate that we're having in this country at the moment. How do we solve the immense problems that we have without becoming the monsters of the past that we so uh, uh, condemn or talk against? Because that's the big thing. The big threat that you have is that when you are so committed to righting the wrongs of the past, you then uh, resort to means that are unjust in themselves because uh, it, the ends cannot justify the means because the means that you employ influence the ends that you produce. And 
for in Afri Forum's case, we think that there are lots of African countries that we can learn from. Botswana is a very good example. Botswana has a very strong commit commitment to property rights, protecting property rights, and to the uh, uh, an economy that encourages entrepreneurship and business. Uh, I mean. What Secretary Pompeo here says when he talks about the centralized state threatening economic growth and being a disaster, we saw this just a few weeks in Johannesburg where there was a man who sold uh, sandwiches next to the road and just to, to send his daughter to school. And this man, he comes from a poor background and he uplifted himself by his, all by himself with no assistance from the state. And he was earning 20,000 rand a, a month through his own business that he started. The, and reality, then the, and then the objective just, reality, though, is that we have a system in South Africa where that Section 25 of the Constitution has not been amended, and already we are seeing these catastrophic uh, uh, economic situations right. play out in yeah. our country. But just to, to finish that thought... 2017, um, a report by uh, government states that at that point, 72% of um, uh, commercial farms in this country were still in right hands. That is the reality that we are dealing with. Right, but you also talk, but just to, it's very quickly, and I'll let my colleague speak. It's just, uh, and this man in Johannesburg that was selling sandwiches, the government stepped in and they took his, uh, they took his stock. The police took it because he didn't have a license or he had some type of discrepancy or error on his license. That is what Secretary Pompeo is, is warning against. That type, type of state encroachment where the state is trying to micromanage uh, prosperity rather than letting the, the market do itself and let people like him be uh, examples to South Africans that you can do it without state assistance or giving the state more power. Um, uh, Dr. Karungu, and as you respond, because let's also not forget that Afri Forum has been on some sort of charm offensive uh, to countries like the United States where they have been spreading this message, uh, highlighting their fears, as it were, about uh, this coming situation. A, a very great concern because in the sense that I keep on saying, you see, the interest of the privileged to protect the long-term future of their interest. In other words, the tenure or for the farmers, or for our free forum members, or for all of us, is tied to the situation of the poverty in the country. If you don't address these issues, the threat is not more to the black community, it's more to you guys. Because it will happen that is inevitable, that the majority cannot subject it to the pain of helplessness, which was emanating from a situation they didn't have power over. That's why you see a lot of tension in the country. I answer that. I get worried when people give the worst case scenario to justify what somebody said. When I keep on hearing about Zimbabwe, the case of Sadwich, I get worried. Let me tell you why. Zimbabwe's scenario ought to be in Afri Forum, if they were genuine, to say the result of what we saw in Zimbabwe was to delay accessing or flood by the majority. Instead of addressing the issue in 1980, they waited for more than 20 years to try to do it. It became literally impossible. So you are right. If we don't do it, it could be chaotic going forward, I package. However, look at it this way. In economic, there are four natural resources that drive the economy. We start by land. Land is a natural resource. It's given by nature to us. Each one of us has a right because you cannot be born to live up in the sky. The second one the is labor. are concerns valid in terms of that uh, disposition uh, that Afri Forum is envisaging? Uh, you know, when we talk about expropriation of land without compensation, uh, should we acknowledge uh, their concerns as valid? It, the concern is valid because, in my view, with respect, they are opportunistic. I remember there was a commission headed by Judge Baum. I used to work with him. They were supposed to allow free seller, willing seller, willing buyer. It was tried left, right, center. We are where we are because nobody did. That's our package. Number two, we, the government is also saying, we would rather not do it. We're going to do it when we are forced to, because it's inevitable that we have to give opportunity for the majority in order to create jobs. It's nobody, I don't hear the government saying we are going to take land by four. They are saying, we're going to move that way because all else has failed. 
appeal to you guys. But why has it failed? And what sort of culpability does government have to accept in this regard as well? And I'm going to park you. Uh, we'll come back to that. If you both uh, would stay, stay with us, we're going to take the news and then come back uh, to this discussion with uh, Ernest Fansel and Professor Karungu. But right now, 8 o'clock news with Leanne.